Okay. So we're streaming live on YouTube, are we? Yeah, so we have it live on YouTube. I'm just trying for some reason, I've lost my screen where I can see everybody. So I'm just trying to get that set, but we do uh, want to welcome everyone here today. And um, we are excited and we wanna thank everyone for joining. I think it's still probably taking a few minutes for everyone to come in. So if we can just all hold tight for a little bit as the participants all enter the the Zoom space, then we will begin after we see that there's no others joining for just a minute. <clears throat> and we're gonna use the Q&A or the chat. Yeah, and we function. will, yeah, so members that wanna, that want to um, ask questions, they can put that down in the Q&A and then they'll be able to see everything going on and um, yeah, so I'll just go ahead and take a minute. Um, my name is Bridget Milden. I'm the CEO and founder of FND Hope. And today we have with us professor, honorary professor actually, but uh, Professor John Stone from the University of Edinburgh. We've been practicing how I say that because I, I guess I say it wrong. So hopefully I didn't disappoint you too much, Dr. Stone. Um, thank you for being here today. And we're actually going to start the um, webinar off with a little a small presentation that Dr. Stone will go over the basics. We also want to um, thank FND Hope Canada, Christine, she's with us and helping behind the scenes uh, with some of the Q&A questions. And so we just want to also acknowledge her help as well. So thank you. And we'll just go ahead and turn the time over to you, Dr. John Stone. Well, thanks very much, Bridget. Um, I mean, just a little bit about me and 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 also our, um, and us, Bridget. I mean, I've been in this area for a coming up for 25 years now started when I was a started my interest in this as a trainee in, in neurologist in the 1990s as you, some of you might be able to tell I'm not actually Scottish although I've lived in Edinburgh for, for nearly 30 years now um, and I, I work as a general adult neurologist but I've been doing research in, in FND with my uh, group um, Alan Carson, Laura McWhirter, Ingrid Herzan particularly uh, for a long time now. So I'm really, it's great to be able to speak to you about FND and really looking forward to uh, having a Q&A with you. And um, I've known Bridget for over 10 years now. Um, so we've had long, long, long standing uh, collaboration, which I've really appreciated. I've learned so much from, um, from being able to obviously talk to patients that I meet in clinic, but getting a, that different perspective from patients out there in the wider community, patient-led organizations making such a difference now in FND. So I just wanted to say that and thanks to everything that that, uh, that you do in FND Hope. Well, thank so you. That. What I've got for you to today is I've got, I was going to talk for about 15 minutes about FND, the basics, which was the title that Bridget gave me, just to sort of let set the scene where we are in terms of how we're thinking about FND in terms of making a diagnosis what do we think is going on uh, to cause it and what do we know about treatment and what where do, where are we heading with treatment because I thought that might be useful to, uh, before we get into the Q&A so I'm obviously not going to cover everything uh, but I hope this, this is a useful introduction so first of all what is a functional disorder and the way I think about this in neurology is that we have disorders of structure of the brain where we can see things on a scan like brain tumours and MS, multiple sclerosis. And then there are these really common disorders of function where we know the brain's going wrong, but we can't see it on these conventional tests that we have in the clinic. And I would FND is an example, but so is migraine. And you could argue about other disorders as well. And so the way that we try and understand that, help people understand that in clinic is to very commonly, one of the analogies is to think about there, there are disorders where there's a hardware problem, something's gone burnt out in the computer, 
and there are disorders of software, which is actually what most computer problems are, aren't they? When the, you get that blue spinning circle and you think it's gone wrong and you might uh, try and reboot the computer. So I think there's a, it's an analogy. Obviously the brain is not, but I think it's a useful analogy. And if you don't like computers, sometimes people understand that um, a piano can go wrong because it's broken like this one here and it needs its keys replaced or, and a piano can also go wrong because it needs tuning. It's, there's nothing actually broken, it's, but it sounds horrible and it's not working as a piano should. So that's another analogy to a functional disorder. And something that gets that does cause quite a lot of confusion is the difference between a functional disorder and a functional neurological disorder. And it is a bit tricky because all functional disorders kind of involve the brain and nervous system. Uh, but here's some functional disorders. Um, uh, some of these might be considered quite controversial. Migraine, I have a lot of migraine. I regard that as one of my functional disorders. Uh, many forms of chronic pain, not all of them. Uh, irritable bowel syndrome, fibromyalgia are disorders primarily of nervous system functioning. That's all it really means. And But FND describes a subset of those so particularly symptoms like paralysis, seizures, tremor, numbness, speech problems. So FND is not all functional symptoms. And particularly, it doesn't actually include pain, uh, even though pain is really common in people with FND. And we'll come back to that. So I just wanted to sort of start off by just bit, make it clear what we mean by FND. It's these particular symptoms. So FND is not a new problem. These are some photographs of patients with FND in the 19th century. And actually, you read material there, and there's photographs. You can identify the same type of presentations that we see now. Um, and doctors actually were, had much, in many ways, had more of an interest in it then than they did for most of the 20th century. And I've, I've learned a lot by reading uh, that old work. And in World War I, we had soldiers with shell shock um, who also had FND symptoms that were very clearly documented and are the same as some of the symptoms that we see now. So here's me in 2004 um, in my back garden with my wife and two children. And I put that up just to sort of think about how things have changed since then. And I know there's, an awful, there's a huge amount of frustration, stigma and difficulties for many people with FND now, but actually it was even it was a lot worse then. Um, so typical kind of responses to people with FND would be uh, well, there's nothing really wrong. The scan's normal, and because the scan's normal, it must be a psychological problem. Um, and many physicians and neurologists, I don't know, they still behave like that in, in lots of places in lots of places now as well. But many of them would would be seem quite happy with just saying, well, your tests are normal, not my problem goodbye and these patients with FND have have often been failed very badly by healthcare systems and 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 I know continue to be so but nonetheless things have changed uh, and are changing in the, that process so this was a, a really interesting uh, survey that FND hope did um, just looking at this issue of how often patients with FND did experience stigma uh, feeling dismissed, a massive number of people um, had said yes, they had had the experience of feeling dis dismissed or disrespected by a medical professional, which is really awful and uh, really quite shameful, really, for this condition and something that needs to change and, and I think is beginning to change now. So, of course, everyone on this call knows that FND is disabling and real. And I just thought I'd introduce you here to Rachel, who has very kindly let us film her for this short video, which is you'll, you'll find on uh, YouTube and on my site. So I'll just let Rachel speak for herself. In an ideal health service, all doctors and professionals would be actually made aware of this. And um, we wouldn't be treated as so, not like we're faking, but almost like as so it's not real. Um, and that doesn't really help us because we're thinking, oh, what's, what's wrong with me? So Rachel's a university student. You could see in that picture that she had weakness down the right side. Um, so she had a functional hemiparesis. She also had 
some functional dystonia. If we go back to the beginning there, you can see her hand is sort of in a, in a claw, her foot's slightly turned in. Uh, there you can see the foot's turned in. These are features of FND. You can get some of those things with other, other disorders as well, but that's that was her diagnosis. And whereas in the past, uh, certainly for most of the 20th century, doctors would emphasize, they would think about FND when tests were normal. Um, that's that really is not the way that is not the way you diagnose FND. That's actually quite a dangerous way to diagnose any condition, really, just doing lots of doing some tests and saying it's normal. The obvious response from a patient would be, well, you just haven't done enough tests yet. Um, so in fact, it turns out FND does have its own set of typical features, uh, which means that you can make this diagnosis often at the bedside or on the base of a typical history, for example, of seizures. Um, and it also means that you can diagnose FND in somebody who, who has an additional problem. So I have patients who have FND and MS, FND and Parkinson's disease. So here is one of these typical signs, and you'll see here, so because Rachel's weak down her right side, I'm asking her to push against my hand with her knees, and you'll see what happens when I do that. So can I just get you to push against my hand here? And we can see when we do that, you're stronger than I am, yeah. and I can't push that knee in. Um, and then I want, let's try and do the same thing with this knee. So stop me from pushing in, push out as strong as you can. But I'm winning there, yeah. pushing your knee in. Let's go back to this side. I want you to push out again as hard as you can. Really stop me. Push, 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 push. Now when we do that, we can see that actually what's happening over on the right side is that I can't, it's become much stronger and I can't push the knee in now. Mm -hmm. So it's brought out the automatic movement. So that's called the hip abductor sign. It's one of dozens actually of features of FND that we, that we know are, have described. Um, what, what that test is showing, as I've said to Rachel, is that when the more she tries to move, the worse it gets. So she's got this impairment of voluntary movement, um, but the automatic movements are normal. So doctors used to have, didn't have, did know about these tests, but they would often keep them secret from patients. And, um, what we found is that sharing this information with patients uh, is incredibly helpful because then they can see both how the, why we're saying what we're saying, that you've got a disorder of, of voluntary movement, but the tests show us that the, that the pathways are not damaged, but they're just not working. And they're particularly not working when you're really trying. So um, can we find a therapy that promotes that automatic movement and helps your brain work better? So what about stress? Because this, in the 20th century anyway, that was the main uh, way that doctors would think about FND. They think, well, this is a disorder caused by stress, either recent stress or something in the past. And this is something that's been studied again in detail by many groups, and we've synthesized that literature. And what, what's clear is that stress and, and previous adverse events are, are a major risk factor for FND, there's no doubt about that but they don't apply to everybody. Um, so you often see, you see things like, you know, bad things that have happened in the past are probably about three or four times more common in people with FND than they are in the population. So that means quite a lot of people with FND have had those experiences. But still, the majority of people with FND have not had those experiences. So it's a risk factor, um, a bit like smoking is a really important risk factor for heart disease. But it's not the only cause. You wouldn't say that all heart attacks are caused by smoking, but you would still want to think about smoking when you meet someone with a heart attack. I think the problem in the past has been that doctors have, have been really insistent that everyone must have stress. And that's a bit like insisting that everyone with a heart attack must have been a smoker, even though we, you know, we all know that's not the case. So that's how we see stress and um, previous trauma and psychological risk factors now. In fact, the other thing that's become clear was something that they also knew in the 19th century was that actually another just as important risk factor probably is other neurological problems. So having migraine, having a condition like epilepsy in the past, sciatica, joint hypermobility, 
is a very common problem affecting uh, perhaps up to one in six of the population, but it probably is a risk factor for functional disorders as well. So we should be looking for these things and also treating them. So just because someone's got FND doesn't mean that they might not also have another neurological or other medical condition that's relevant. Now, people didn't really think about the brain in the 20th century, but um, of course it's going on in the brain. You know, what other organ is it going on in is, is often the thing I say. And in fact, we have been able to demonstrate using, this is not normal brain scan. So this isn't a kind of MRI or CT you'd get in a hospital. This is a functional brain scan. And it only really is helpful in a research setting. So it's not helpful just for making a normal diagnosis. But we've been able to show that there are changes in brain function in people with FND. So here you see an area of the brain that's not working very well, this in yellow. And this corresponds to symptoms down the opposite side of the body. So you see, we see changes in the brain that are kind of where we might expect them to see for the kind of disorders people have. There's a lot more research needs to be done, uh, but I think uh, we've definitely seen changes in the brain. And it's not just in one spot, it's more in networks and circuits in the brain have gone wrong, really showing that what we're saying to patients really is that there's a problem with the software of the brain. So in the UK, at least, FND is becoming, and I'm, del you know, I'm delighted to say, is becoming a mainstream condition. Just this year, the, we've changed the curriculum for neurology trainees so that FND is actually one of the eight conditions, the core conditions that trainee neurologists need to need to learn about during their training, which I think is an uh, incredible milestone actually for us. Um, we are it is becoming a mainstream problem. I know that's not the case in other countries, um, but um, it, things are changing. We've got the FND Society now, which has about. 700 members internationally and we've had conferences in Edinburgh and Boston had one this year in Boston and nearly a thousand people online and present so so there are lots of health professionals multidisciplinary interested in this problem now if you've got FND what can you do about it I know there's lots of people out there listening to this who've either got FND or someone in their family has and it's uh, a desperate situation for many people well, I do think I do think knowledge can be power. Um, the more you know about the condition and have confidence that, that is co the correct condition, which I know can be an issue, the more you're like the, the the better that is, and the more you're able to probably benefit from treatment. So, um, well, obviously, FND Hope and the other charities and patient advocates have done a brilliant job of of giving of providing information. This is my website that I started in two thousand and nine. Um, I know that a lot of people are given this website and nothing else, and so sometimes it gets a bit of a bad press for that. I'm, I'm well aware of that. In fact, it's my first FAQ is uh, why have I just been given this website and nothing else? So I'm sorry if that's happened to you because I don't think that should happen. Um, but this website was made to try and help people who <laughs> with their with their treatment. And there's an app as well on the App Store, which might make it easy to look at. I did just want to quickly plug this new thing I've put made here, which is a called a formulation tool or formulator. And this is an attempt to try and just launch this last week. And um, I'm hoping that patients and clinicians will use it to try and improve communication, particularly after they've made a diagnosis of FND, try and encourage that clinician to see the patient again. This is a way I'm hoping that patients will find useful to record their symptoms, record their thoughts about what's maybe caused their FND, what hasn't caused their FND, what treatments they would like, wouldn't like, uh, what diagnosis they think. So, so I think we FND treatment does depend on really good communication between uh, health professionals and patients. So that's, if you have just been diagnosed with FND and you're going to an appointment, I'd be really in, help, uh, glad for feedback about this and whether you find it useful. It prints out a report of your symptoms that you can give to your uh, give to your health professional. And there's more developments coming. If you don't have anybody in your area who seems to be interested in FND, then I really recommend this FND uh, Hope Provider page. If you don't know about that, that uh, you can find it on their website, and it has lists of people who are 
interested in FND. And I, I just think it's a, a fantastic what's happening with patient-led organizations um, around the world with FND, because I think we this will be the thing that will really make a difference. It doesn't matter how many doctors are interested. I think we need patients to be um, lobbying and complaining about things when they're not working and also providing support to each other. So the fact that we've got in the UK, we've got Lorraine Kelly, who if, if you're in the UK, she needs no introduction. She's incredibly well-known um, TV presenter. And we've got things like Niagara Falls and uh, CN Tower lit up is, is great. Now I'm aware of time here, but I just in the last few slides, I just want to talk about some of the treatments that can help with FND. I'm, I'm also going to say as well that, that I'm not saying at any point here that these treatments help everyone or that everyone needs all these treatments, but they can help in some people. And here's um, Miranda, who's a primary school teacher in Australia, talking about her functional gait disorder that she had as part of FND. My mum was there filming at the time and she thought that it was crazy. And then he just made it faster and faster. And that's when we discovered that I could, could run. I could go quickly, but not slowly. So she talks about her treatment and that's something that can happen in FND. People can't walk, but they can run. And it, it, it's a disorder where these weird things do actually do make sense. And then this is her having gone through lots of treatment where she's trying to promote those automatic movements, realizing one day that she is walking normally. Sam and I, we were in depth conversation and then it wasn't until we were halfway down the street that, that we both realized that I was walking like normally. That is a miracle. And my biggest fear then was to stop walking. I just kept walking because I was like, if I sit down and stop, what if I can't walk again? So I know that those sorts of improvements aren't always possible, but I do want to, you know, I think that's why FND Hope is so brilliantly named, because I think we need to give people hope. If we're embarking on treatment, you need some hope to, to do that. And improvement is possible in FND. Um, psychological therapy has, can play a massively important role uh, in FND. This is uh, Kinjal Goyal in India. I've tried to go international with my uh, hero therapists here. So um, it can help in all kinds of ways, particularly for seizures, where, there's, where we've got a really quite well-defined treatment. Help with many people with FND do have problems with anxiety, panic, depression, or they've had other, or they, or they have had trauma in the past. And, and looking at those things can be really helpful. Occupational therapy, I think this is a still from a previous FND Hope webinar from Claire Nicholson in London, it can be a really great treatment for FND, helping people improve activity, promoting those automatic movements. And this is Jan Baker in Australia, who's uh, led a speech therapy uh, recommendation, because I think the speech therapy for FND is different to what you would do for other conditions. It's one of the point, one of the important points here is that these treatments are different. And if you do have a lot of pain as well as FND, then it's really worth learning about pain and our new ideas about what's causing chronic pain. Essentially, in most people, chronic pain is an increase in the volume knob in your pain pathways that you can't see on a scan and you can't just reach into your body and turn it down. It is really happening. And if you will, and I really recommend this video, Tame the Beast, um, about that and uh, to learn more about pain and, and then to think about how that overlaps with FND as a problem with nervous system functioning. If your therapists don't know about this, uh, don't know about the difference of treatment, well, here's some things for them. I know it's awkward perhaps giving this to a therapist, but these are, these are respected sort of publications about the management and treatment of FND that might be helpful to share uh, in some situations. And I know that there's these sorts of experiences are common. I get because I get emails all the time from people. Um, although I should say that I, I, you know, I don't have a private practice and can't actually see people privately. Um, but you know, I can't find anyone to help, or I'm on a 12 month waiting list, or I did see someone, but they were really upsetting because they dismissed me or made me feel like I was putting it on. Um, or I've actually I've had good therapists and good health professionals and I've done everything and still I'm the same. So although I've presented treatment, I, I do want to recognize that all of these scenarios are common as well. So thank you for listening to that. And I hope that's helpful. 
starting point and it'd be great to get into the q a i'll stop sharing well thank you for that i think it was very helpful and you know i as you're going through many of the different uh, elements throughout f and i think you answered actually quite a few questions that we have in our q a and first, again, I want to welcome everyone here. We have a great attendance, and that's um, great to see that we can hopefully help a lot of people at once. Uh, starting with, you know, I'm, I, kind of some of these questions I'm going to group together because there, there definitely is a common theme, I think, amongst many of them. Um, I think one of the first things I noticed on the diagnosing uh, the question was geared towards children, but I think it's probably the same for children and adults in many instances, but who should be diagnosing FND? Yeah, that is a good question. I, um, it should be someone with expertise in the diagnosis of neurological conditions. So that is usually a neurologist, but it doesn't have to be. And I don't want to exclude, you know, there are, there are doctors out there like neuropsychiatrists and stroke physicians and other general physicians who do have that expertise. So it's not so much the, the job title, but it's the the expertise that they got. There are a lot of pitfalls in the diagnosis. There are a lot of neurological conditions that look pretty weird. You should never diagnose FND just because something looks weird anyway. And I'm aware that sometimes doc doctors, perhaps more often non-neurologists, do reach for this diagnosis uh, when they shouldn't do or when they should be, or, or they make mistakes like we see someone with a lot of who's had a lot of stress and trauma or psychiatric problems or something that looks weird and they reach for the diagnosis of fnd uh, for that reason when they shouldn't that is that is how to make a mistake i think well and i think it's fair to say and acknowledge that all diagnoses can be misdiagnosed yep. and it's important that every patient get the correct diagnosis because that's the only way to usually access the right treatment. And so it's not uncommon, uh, but we definitely are most certainly trying to minimize that, um, I guess, the how common it can be. Um, and on that topic, Bridget, I think it's really important to say that doctors get the other diagnoses wrong sometimes as well. So epilepsy particularly, um, but other conditions, MS, you know, there's, there's a about one in 20 diagnoses in neurology turn out to be wrong initially. And that's just live, it's just medicine and neurology. It's a hard, it's a hard thing to get right all the time. Absolutely. It, um, we're gonna move kind of in, there's several questions on symptoms and I'm gonna kind of group these together. So hopefully uh, there's a question regarding symptoms as far as do they get worse as you get older? Uh, do symptoms, if you have symptoms every day, because a lot of people talk about these symptoms waxing and waning, but if yours aren't, is that still FND? And yeah. I think we could even say on the uh, contrary to the other, you know, side that waxing and waning. Um, can you kind of hit a little bit on some of that yeah. as far as symptoms? So yeah, most I'd say most people with FND have symptoms all the time. Uh, I mean, obviously, if you have seizures and you don't have symptoms all the time, uh, but yeah, if you've got symptoms all the time, that, that's really common with FND. There are people who, who notice periods of the day when their symptoms are much better. That does happen also. Um, yeah, the issue of what happens, yeah, I think you said what happens as people get older. Did you, did you ask that? Yeah, yeah, or I guess is there a progressiveness about FND? So I'm aware, actually, this is I've got this down to write something on my website, more about this on the website because it's a common issue. It if people say what's going to happen to me it's one of the hardest questions i have because we know and i've done i've been involved in many of the long-term follow-up studies where we have tried to answer this question and if you look for example we did a study of people with functional limb weakness in edinburgh and we showed that 14 years later um probably about 40 percent of those patients still had the symptom quite badly and they were still quite badly affected, but they're also a group about 20% who were completely better. So we're seeing a whole range of outcomes from completely better to, oh, it's still there, or it's a bit worse than it was before. It is a condition that can slowly get worse over time. It's a condition that can slowly improve over time. 
And this is, I know that's an incredibly frustrating answer because you want to know what's going to happen to you. But um, I think, and I, what we've also learned is that it's very hard to predict who can, who's going to get better or not. And those studies that we have were, were done on people who didn't really get that much treatment. So I am hopeful that if we, if we have, if we had much better treatment programs, that those long-term outcomes will be better as well. Um, it, so a lot of people say, you know, come to the clinic and say, well, I'm not sure that this is FND because it's getting worse. Um, most of the time it still is FND when that's happening. Well, and I think one of the biggest fallacies that we tried to really approach in the beginning was uh, it was quite common for patients to begin to be told that since I've diagnosed you, you should, this will just go away on its own. And that's not typically the case. While it can happen, it, it usually usually actually didn't. And so I think it is important to just keep going back and reiterating that everybody is so different. And you know, asking a doctor to predict that is is you'd have probably better like going to a fortune teller, you know, to try to give an answer like that because it's just unfortunate. But that's where we're at. Another question regarding symptoms um, is also in relation you kind of talked about how they can change periodically. We find that a lot of patients, female patients notice a change during their menstrual cycle. Do you find that in your practice? And do you have anything that you could maybe speak to yeah. that? No, absolutely. I mean, one of the things I say in response to that is, can we think of any condition that is not worse around the time of the men, you know, because if it's really about just having other things wrong with you, isn't it? So if, you, if you've got a long-term condition and then you're having all the problems, all the symptoms that come around the time of period, well, yeah, you'd expect it to be worse. So I think that's a common experience. Um, we are doing some work and research at the moment on, on FND and pregnancy as well, which is a common, a common issue. And there, I think it's interesting because I think some, some patients improve a bit during pregnancy, uh, not everybody, and sometimes get a bit worse after. But that, again, you see those sort of did those those report something sim very similar in epilepsy, migraine, other other neurological conditions. Well, and I think if you really look at how much the body changes during that time for women, there's inflammatory markers, there's hormones, there's so many other things, and yeah. and it's probably less um, of a surprising that it would have impacted. I, I would kind of think. Uh, the next question we have is regarding to medication and how medication um, can maybe impact functional symptoms. Question is, can Zoloft, uh, but I know others have mentioned other um, medications, can that increase the frequency and depth of functional like tremor or any other symptoms? Yeah, so that's, yeah, that's a big question. I mean, so I'm just checking Zoloft because that's the US search, search lane, yeah. Oh, okay. So, um, yeah, so there isn't any any clear study saying that there is a specific medication that will make an, an FND symptom definitely better. We have a little bit of evidence in functional seizures that medications like Zoloft, which is sertraline, might be helpful. And I think my experience is that it can be helpful uh, some for some people, but it is for some people. I think where, where it's easier to recommend medication is where someone has FND and they also have very clear cut depression or anxiety or panic. Um, then if, you know, if they've got that as well, well then there's a much better evidence base for using medication there. Um, I have to say, I spend a lot of time reducing and stopping medication rather than adding it in my patients. A lot of patients come to me because they've got chronic pain, they've ended up on uh, heavy duty medications with codeine and tramadol and morphine and um, medicines like that, which I don't, which we know from pa the pain literature, um, don't actually have a good evidence base for long term pain. They're good for acute pain or cancer pain. I'm, I'm aware here we've got lots of patients in the audience, so please don't stop any medications on the basis of this conversation. Uh, always talk to your doctor because there may be specific reasons why you're on that medication or why why it's be a bad idea to stop it. And there's also things to discuss about stopping and side effects when you when you stop medication. Sometimes that could be an issue. Um, but yeah, medications are not it can be helpful, but they're not a, a great route for many patients. 
with that kind of thing, unfortunately. Well, and just looking at another question down here, and I think you kind of already touched on it, but just to be clear, there are not any medications that have been recommended or are used, anything that is being used for functional disorder would be an off-label use. Is that accurate? Um, not not quite, no. If you're talking about, again, if you're talking about functional disorders generally, so that would include, you know, fibromyalgia and irritable bowel and things like that. There are, there are actually good, uh, there are actually evidence-based treatments. And I think that for seizures, uh, there's, there's reasonable evidence for at least having that discussion about, you know, is this going to, is this, does this suit you? Um, are we, is it the right time to be, to be trying that? So um, I don't want to put people off medication, but I, I neither do. I, I think it's important not to be pinning your hopes on that or, or indeed, unfortunately, any kind of quick fix. That's one of the sort of disappointing things, messages that I'm constantly delivering is that, mm -hmm. you know, well, it's good that we know what's wrong. Um, bad news there's no quick there's no quick fix good news there might be a slow fix is how I'd, and, and focusing on that slow fix I think. absolutely and I just want to reiterate again what you had mentioned about those of us those that are listening uh, do not stop uh, medications speak with your medical provider and make sure that that is done appropriately. Some need to be worked down. And so it's really important that patients and family members don't encourage their, you know, other family members to go off medication without having that discussion with their healthcare provider. And uh, so kind of moving a little bit from that, uh, I want to, there's a great question here. Uh, hi, what advice do you have for someone who has improved to about a 60 to 70%, but wants to get closer to that hundred percent? Any small improvement makes such a difference to quality of life. And this patient's had um, symptoms for six years. And she also wants to thank you for all the um, support and advice you give. Thank you. Well, it's tricky that, isn't it? Because it depends, you know, it does depend what symptoms you're talking about. I suppose there does come a point where I think I do meet patients where they've they've met, you know, patients who in our local service with great therapists who can uh, impart what they know, and the patient gets to the point where they've 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 worked really hard with that, and the therapists have worked hard, and they've got to the point where they perhaps don't have anything extra to teach the patient because it is about teaching patients and helping them to sort of uh, uh, with their with their symptoms I, I suppose you might then be looking you know what's in the way you know being really honest with yourself about what's in the way to feeling better um, and there's all sorts of things that can be in the way um, I meet a lot of people who who I think genuinely do love their job but they also their job is also making them ill um, and they're maybe not always honest about that. Uh, I meet people who are place huge demands on themselves and expectations. I met someone this week who had started to improve when she realized that she didn't need to be a superwoman at work. And it was OK to, to, to work normal hours or to say no to things. Um, so those sort of lifestyle changes, I mean, those are the sort of things that can that come up during psychological therapy as well. Um, I notice those a change of life style can sometimes have a surprising effect for, for many people. So that's one one area. There are there, there are many others. Well, and I think there is always kind of a, a idea of what fun functional patients look like in the past, and that was probably one of the first things that I recognized as I met more and more people with this diagnosis that those um, stereotypes were actually backwards almost, that many of these um, people in our community are very high functioning, educated, and uh, just perfectionists almost, and just always striving to, to do a lot. And so, and help others, very compassionate people. And, and so I, I think recognizing, you know, that balance. Another question I want to touch on um, is from Australia. She is here. It's 4 a.m. We appreciate those from the Australia community that have gotten up uh, so late or stayed up, if, depending on what side of the country they're on, to be with us. So her question is, what research is linking autism and FND um, primarily in teenage girls? But I, you know, I know that we've noticed that there are 
there seems to be a high prevalence of autism in our community. Yeah. Uh, do you know of any connection there? Or Great question. I that? think I think this is an area of evolving research. I think it's my own experience as well. I think what's happened is that um, we're recognizing autism more than we used to. We're probably also recognizing mild autistic traits and autistic spectrum in a way that we didn't before. And I think there probably it probably is an, another risk factor for um, functional disorders in general. Um, but we don't we don't have concrete research. But it, that is my experience. So I think any kind of neuro develop we we think of those as as a sort of developmental disorder, or sometimes it's not even a disorder, is it? I'm aware that many people don't regard their autism as a disorder. It's just who they are. Um, but those differences having a, a sort of different brain uh, for any reason, either developmentally or a brain condition, probably increases the risk of FND somewhat. So uh, more to learn about that, but yeah, something something that we need to look out for as clinicians. So similarly for ADHD, also sort of emotional instability, which is, which is another part of a sort of, another sort of developmental issue. And, um, and I mentioned, joint hypermobility, which is a more physically evident developmental condition, which, you know, can is usually just normal and doesn't create problems, but but I probably is a, a risk factor for functional disorders too. Thank you. Another question is regarding Botox and its effect for dystonia, functional dystonia. Yeah. So there was a really interesting uh, large trial that was done in the Netherlands. It was a really well conducted trial where they tried to answer this question because that's the best way to answer these questions, do a randomized trial. And they gave half the patients Botox and they gave the other half um, uh, placebo. So it was just an injection of saline and the clinicians and the patients didn't know which was which. And what they showed was that there was no difference between them. But they also so but what they also showed is that both groups improved and they probably improved and they showed that there was longer term benefit as well and they probably improved more than you might have expected the a, a group of patients to do with no treatment so we did so the trial didn't show that botox helped but they showed that fnd is one of those conditions where you you know there's things gone gone wrong in the brain in terms of programs what the brain expects and there's something about having a healthcare interaction having a treatment that can have an effect and we know that placebo is not just it's not just a sugar pill it's not just it's when when people have a treatment like that it has powerful effects on the brain it changes neurotransmitters in the brain and so we we've, we've we've we need to learn from 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 studies like that and what they're telling us the bottom line though is that we've you probably shouldn't be having just Botox for, for uh, functional dystonia, but it does. the trials do show that improvement is possible. We need to find ways of doing that transparently, I think. Thank you. Uh, another question is, is there any understanding of link between photosensitivity and dissociative or functional seizures? Um, also a link between <clears throat> nosebleeds immediately or after a seizure? red patchy cheeks before seizure in general onset um, with blood pressure or heart rate? So yeah, quite a lot of work in these sort of areas. So what we know about functional seizures is that they, we know a lot more about them than we used to. So typically in a functional seizure, what's happening is the body is going to a state of red alert. So we do see huge increases in heart rate, blood pressure, uh, sometimes the heart goes very fast and then it goes very slow. Um, that's part of the seizure, really. So when you see someone going very red, uh, that's, that's part of their body going into a into a state of uh, into a state of red alert. And what's often happening is that the the reason the person blacks out is they're going into a trance-like state. Their their brain is is making them do that because it it's getting it's getting rid of a horrible feeling it's getting you know the the this there's this overwhelming uh, sort of fight or flight threat response that's going on in the body um, and the brain learns that if it if it makes a blackout happen that it can protect the person take them away from having to experience that so 
Um, and that's what you're trying to retrain the retrain the brain or help the person with in therapy is to so their brain doesn't do that to them because it's really not helpful. So its brain's trying to be helpful, but it is not helpful when it makes makes you have a seizure. I don't think I'm not sure I answered all of that question, but hopefully some of it. There, there's a lot of pieces in there, so I yeah. think we did pretty good. <laughs> uh, I, you kind of mentioned before in your talk, uh, but let's just touch on it again. Can a PET CT scan show FND? Uh, can you speak a little bit to some of that, the scans again? Yeah, so I know that, yeah, so I think, I mean, it's not surprising that if you've got a disorder of brain function, that you're going to see changes in brain function on a scan. So I mean, that is indeed what we've seen on on. These are these are research tools at the moment. So functional MRI, um, we used to see them on the SPECT. Um, they're not useful for you know for individuals. I sometimes get emails from people saying, "Can my can I have an fMRI?" Because then, and I think it's I think it's it's understandable. People want to they want to have some evidence on a on a scan or test to show that's what it is. So I get that, but at the moment we can't do that. There's no one. If anyone's offering you that that as a test, then it's the, it's not correct. There isn't a way of that. That's not a valid test for this condition. Um, but yeah, it's definitely going on in the brain. And as I said, where where else would it be going on in the body? If you think about the different organs of your body, where else is it going on? Of course, it's the brain. Um, yeah. Well, and I think you know, hope maybe someday there will be something. You know, I mean. I, I'm not sure, but I, I do appreciate the work that's been done in this field, in that area of um, research, because I the scans do show that patients are faking it. And I think that's really a big issue that patients run up against. So while we can't diagnose FND, I think it's really important to point out that we can prove that patients aren't faking symptoms. Is that correct? I think, yeah, I mean, I think we can prove that without a scan, but I think the scan, uh, I think scans are, do provide an additional level there, so diff additional perspective. We've done, people have done scans where people pretend to have a weak leg or pretend to have symptoms. They've even done scan where people with FND compared their FND symptom, like a tremor, with the same patient pretending to have that, and it was different. So, yeah, I think it does it does provide some evidence of that. Although I think that's pretty obvious anyway. But um, but it, yeah, it, it's probably helped the scientific community take this condition more seriously. But there are, there are many other ways to do that. I think. Kind of looking at you know, I'm trying to kind of go through some of these questions and see how we can answer as many as possible. Uh, I see one question: If there are, are several physical factors that triggered FND, why are children referred to psychiatry and psychology when no known psychological cause is present? Um, of course, there could be in some, but when, in this case, that there's not any present. Can a diagnosis be made without, um, it says, however, but I'm thinking Hoover test, or what other tests can be done to prove that, um, you know, the positive signs that you talked about. But I think that first one is really important. You know, we've unfortunately children with FND have really been left on the sidelines even more than FND patients in general? Yeah, so it's a good question. I've done, a, I've done some, some of the research in, in children as well, collaborating with colleagues, and, and it is clear that in, in children, the frequency of like really bad things that have happened is lower. So, so whilst we see, you know, it's not everyone, it's, it's only a, it's only a proportion, a minority of, of adults, but in children, it's even less the case that stress, that's, or certainly severe adverse events are present. What you do find is that many children with this have experienced stress in relation to school, things like peers, or coming back to this issue of, um, being high achieving or putting pressure on themselves or not being kind enough to themselves, those sorts of things. I think if, if, if you've got, you know, if you've got a child with FND or if someone is listening with, who's a young person, I do think that in many cases, seeing a psychologist or a psychiatrist can still be useful. Can, even if you've, even if none of those things have happened, as long as that health professional is not kind of, 
insisting that bad things must have happened, please, you know, and trying to get that out. I mean, that, that can be really annoying and really upsetting. I think what you can do with a psychologist, psychiatrist who knows about FND is you get more time to get your head around what is a really confusing diagnosis. You can start to think about some of the things we were saying about, you know, what, what stops people getting better? Are they putting pressure on themselves? It's not that they've got you've got psychiatric disorder. It's just that some of the ways that you might have been, you know, if you're one of those people that's always on the go, and you might think that's great, but you know, it is great to be always on the go. But sometimes being always on the go isn't sustainable. You know, so you might need help to not always be on the go and just give yourself a break. So those are the sort of things that I think they can help with, even when you're not depressed or anxious. So, um, so that another question, Bridget, about the. Um, Hoover sign. Hoover sign is only useful if you're if you've got weakness of a leg. It's not useful if it's not a positive sign if you have seizures. There, there are a whole range of signs for each individual symptom that we look for. Well, and I think that kind of answers some of the other questions about uh, like um, there's some about viruses and and could this be pans or other like um, commonly <clears throat> misdiagnosed illnesses, but I think that just keeps going back to the positive signs. Um, I think it does. I mean, I think one of the reasons that, you know, there's always there's always an area of uncertainty in medicine. We haven't discovered all human conditions yet. You know, we're still finding out things. So we have to keep an open mind. Uh, but if you've got a disorder where your leg doesn't move, as you say, when when you want it to, but it does when you're distracted, well, that's telling you something really important about what's gone wrong in the brain. So even if that person has an undiagnosed autoimmune condition, they, they then they still have FND symptoms. And it's still, what have you got to lose by focusing on FND? I think some of these, some of these other conditions acquire a kind of uh, popularity, partly because people have had such stigmatizing negative experiences from, uh, in relation to things like FND, which of course is a great shame um and it's but you know we we would need hours to cover all of these individual conditions so as you say it's all about well is there a positive evidence of fnd or not i think i i think you're right there uh you know another really important question as we kind of move through the process of diagnosis and symptoms is a question, why do GPs not understand or know anything about FND? Why, why do you feel even some neurologists, psychologists, you know, we used to call it the revolving door of care because the neurologist would send the patient to psychology, psychology turn around and send them back to neurology. Why do you think that gap in healthcare is where it's originating from or contributing to it? I think it's originating from the fact that this disorder was just totally has been totally ignored for over a century. And although you've got people like me who've been around in it for 20 years and, and others, um, I could name lots of people, so I better not name anyone. Um, the, the, it, it was when I was training, it was totally invisible. It wasn't in any textbook. I was actually warned off uh, having an interest it was considered a dangerous thing for my career. So that, that was the kind of where we started from. So anyone my age who's a doctor will, will not have been taught anything. We, we teach our medical students about FND, but most, most universities, medical schools don't. Uh, it, it does now appear, in the, it is now in the UK curriculum, but I bet you it's not, in the, it's not really in the US curriculum for neurology. Um, I was, I was at a national neurology meeting last week and I was one of the things I was really pleased to hear was a senior neurologist saying to me, yeah, I still find this diagnosis quite difficult to explain. And she was obviously sympathetic to it, but she found it very hard to, to get her head around it and just talk to patients. But she said, I don't understand it because my juniors seem to find it quite straightforward. They just treat it like any other condition. And I thought, well, that's brilliant. That's great to hear that the young, younger neurologists in the UK just see FND like any other, you know, migraine, epilepsy, MS. It's just another, another condition that we treat. That's what we're, that's what we're looking for. But that that will take decades. And we, I know patients get very disappointed by their experiences. They shouldn't have those experiences. But I think to to make it easier on yourself, try and lower your expectations of what of what a healthcare professional is going to be like with this condition. 
many of them just don't know about it. Well, and, and it is unfortunate, but it is a reality that yep. we are all going to have to live with. I think, you know, looking at the changes that have happened, though, you know, you talk about change taking decades. Well, we've got one decade down, I think. We've been working uh, very hard this last you know, 10 years, but there is always a lot more to do and a lot, er a lot more areas to kind of funnel that into. What do you, um, what are some of the research changes or some of the new things that you're finding and looking into? So I think what in the, you know, I did, and I was covering that this week actually was what, what, you know, what are we going to be talking about in 20 years? I think we'll, I think, as you mentioned, Bridget, the, these functional brain scans where we see the, the brain working might become more mainstream. They might become tests that you can have. Selma Abeck in Bern is doing some really amazing work looking to see if you can tell you've got FND just from a functional brain scan alone. And, you, and it looks like you can in some cases. Um, so we might be seeing that. I think we'll... we'll will discover well we won't discover because i think we can already say that there will be a genetic component to this because there's a genetic component to nearly everything migraine for example strongly genetic anxiety strongly genetic epilepsy um i think we'll hopefully have different kinds of approaches to approaches to treatment using things like virtual reality uh that might be a powerful way of retraining the brain or there's a there's studies going on in other uh, treatment modalities, psilocybin. People are interested in that. Um, electrical stimulation. People are doing trials of that. So people are exploring kind of really new ways of of trying to. It's all ways to change the brain back again. Um, and then I think we'll we'll see a, a people exploring much more the connection with the rest of the body. So we kind of we focus on these neurological symptoms, but we know that most people with FND have have problems with pain and fatigue and their memory and irritable bowel and we need to join all these things up in a much more sensible way rather than having people have you know seven different diagnoses when it's clearly kind of one problem so i hope we can move in that direction as well absolutely and you know there's been a couple questions on here regarding like bladder and bowel changes in functional disorder and uh I think that kind of goes back to kind of, you know, those symptoms. How can we kind of lump them all together and stop kind of each symptom having its own diagnosis? And so we've we've done some work on bladder symptoms in FND. My colleague Ingrid Herzer has done some brilliant work there, just showing how common they are and how disabling. You know, if you can't pee or if you, you know, problems with continence, bladder and bowel is incredibly disabling. People don't want to talk about it. Um, and it does, uh, and, and, and they do link into FND symptoms. And, uh, you know, you're not, your brain doesn't exist on its own. It only exists in your whole body. And so they're all, everything's linked up. Absolutely. And if there is a mechanism that, there, then it could always go wrong. So, you know, and wrong in many different ways. Uh, and I just also want to point out that we did have Ingrid on, uh, webinar. It's been quite a while back, but whoever is looking at that, if they kind of dive into the YouTube, which this is live on YouTube as well, if you want to catch it later, that they could look up some of those older uh, webinars that we had for that. There, here's an interesting question. I don't know if you can speak to it or not, but the question is, do you know how other countries deal with FND, um, such as Asia, South Korea, Japan, China? <clears throat> Yeah, so, um, well, I think the, if I'm honest, I think the probably where we were, those countries just mentioned probably where we were 15, 20 years ago, are starting to be more interested. We had a, we had a uh, really successful webinar, seminar uh, for uh, Chinese speakers through the FND Society. It was really well attended. I'm going to, I've been asked to go to Japan next year uh, to talk about FND. So I think, and, there's, and there are, we, we, we have members from all of those countries in the FND society, but not as many as we do from other countries. So it is definitely patchy and um, yeah, in, improvements needed. Thank you. It's great to see though that 
countries that are farther ahead, maybe in their research or acknowledging the condition are willing to take willing to take your time to reach out to other those. So we appreciate that. Great question here is FND genetic and what is the probability of having a child with FND? If you have FND yourself and maybe just in general, can you? So that's a really common and really understandable question. So when I said earlier about, you know, that I, that, gen, that, you know, we will, I'm sure we will discover that genetics is, is of, of relevance in FND, but it's not a directly hereditary condition. So if you have, I do, you know, I have some families where, you know, a parent and a child both have FND. I do come across that, but quite rarely. So I think for most people with FND, you're not going to pass on FND to your child, but whatever, you know, but you will have some genetic risk factors that explain why you have it. And those genetic risk factors probably make it more likely that the other members of your family might have functional disorders or things that go along with functional disorders. Um, but yeah, fundamentally, you're not going to pass your FND on to your child, or, or, or it'd be very, it's, it's, uh, it's unusual for that to happen. Thank you. And we are getting to the top of the hour, but if we can just fit a couple more questions in here. One, another question we have, and kind of a statement is, I find pacing to be really important to minimize symptoms. Is this the case for others? Yeah, but absolutely. Yeah. So I meet huge numbers of patients who have great difficulty managing their activity um, levels. So when they feel a bit better, they kind of rush around and do all the jobs that they, had, they hadn't done when they were ill. And then they crash either that day or the next day, and they're back to square one again. So a very early and important step in FND management is pacing and learning to try and find a sort of baseline that you can keep going at without overdoing it, learning to do a bit less on your good days, a bit more, a little bit more on your bad days. That's, you need to find that starting point before you can hopefully then at some point build it up a bit and build up the, build up the baseline. But finding it is a, is, a, is a difficult task to begin with and that's where pacing is really helpful. And, you know, I think following on that question, there's another question here. What should I say to family members? who accuse me of allowing this disorder to take hold, or maybe, you know, sometimes that pressure when they are feeling better can come from family members thinking, well, today you're feeling better. I have these higher expectations of you. And so you are trying to meet them. And so trying to, what do you have, I guess, as recommendation for even families trying to work with one another and recognizing how to, how to prevent some of that? I mean, it's so important, isn't it, for friends and fam, you know, close friends and family to know what you're going through and to understand it a bit like you do, to so that they can support you. This is a this is a difficult condition for for everyone to understand, particularly when it's variable like that, coming and going. But you know, my there are many other conditions that come and go, like migraine, epilepsy. Um, so it's I think it's about. Uh, education trying to help people understand it um and and and, and I, i'm aware that some fam some people just get a get a really hard time actually from their family but they say well there's uh, uh, do you really have anything wrong with you because you seem fine yesterday you know so that those conversations just had to be have to be had openly and transparently does does your family member actually believe you when you say that this is really happening to you uh, it's the right. same it's the same conversation you have with a health professional. Well, and I think also talking to the question they have too is as an individual with a disorder, any disorder really, uh, how can you manage your life? Because illness is your life to an extent. It does encroach on things you want to do. Do you have any tips maybe on helping patients maybe find that balance or anything that you've noticed that others maybe help to navigate some of that, that they don't become their illness entirely and that be their only identity. Yeah, I think, yeah, I mean, I, I think it is important. I mean, it, 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 as you say, if you've got a very severe long-term condition, it's hard, it, become, it does become wrapped up with your identity a bit, but I, to some extent trying to resist that, I think, and saying, yeah, I, I have, you know, 
they have this condition, but this condition doesn't have me. You know, sometimes you sometimes you see that. Um, you are more than your condition, and focusing on those aspects of you that are you, and and um, it's it's not easy when you're when you're constantly sort of bombarded by uh, pain or weakness and things. But yeah, trying to trying to keep sight of that, and it comes back to what we were saying earlier about being compassionate to yourself really and uh, not giving yourself a hard time a lot of patients i find uh, we talk about relatives perhaps sometimes blaming patients i think patients i mean a lot of people who blame themselves for being ill somehow where they really need to learn to not do that and recognize that this has happened to them not their fault there are things that they can do that might help them feel better but they really got to stop giving beating themselves up about it and blaming themselves for it well, I think you really hit the nail on the head is that finding fault mm -hmm. that if you're constantly looking for, you know, why did I, did someone put this on me? Did I put it on myself or family? And even with family members, when you can kind of approach that with it, it, it doesn't matter and it's not true, you know, or, you know, looking into that, those dynamics too closely can are not always helpful, but kind of agreement, um, learning to work together. And there was another question on here regarding employers. And, and I think they kind of fit in that same uh, position too, that educating them as much as possible about the condition. So they understand, do you have any other um, suggestions work related for those that maybe are trying to manage work? Yeah. And I think I think work can be difficult, can't it? Particularly if you've got a variable condition, it's a bit perhaps a bit easier these days with a lot more jobs being at home and flexible. Um, I sometimes getting your health health professional to liaise with work just in a straightforward way. Say, yeah, they've got this condition. I'm treating them for it. Can be helpful. The other thing is if it, it dealing with a sort of nosy Parkers who uh, you just want to know what's wrong with you having some strategy to deal with that saying so you don't need to get in i think with everyone you don't need to get into detail oh i've got fnd they'll say what's that you can just say i've got a neurological condition mm -hmm. which i'm having treatment for and you know it, it brackets it's private you know so so that's okay to say that i think or even just a condition um don't need to explain everything to everybody i think all the time I think that's really important too. the people on the street or whatever else yeah. to feel empowered, at least to share what you feel comfortable with at, at any level of, uh, again, we're hitting the end. I think as patients move forward, you know, trying to find help, or maybe they don't have a doctor that they're working well with. Uh, do you have any advice on patients that are maybe struggling to find, I appreciate you bringing up our um, FND, find a, find a doctor portal. Um, I know that's been helpful, but yeah. what can they do? Well, sometimes it's better, isn't it, to try and stick with the one you've got rather than chop and change all the time and have to start again. So if you're not happy with your doctor, you know, let them know and try and try and do so in a way that maybe you can, you can mend your relationship. So, you could say, you know, when you said that to me or when I wrote, read that in your letter, it felt like you were saying, you know, X, Y and Z or it felt like you didn't believe me. Is that the case? Sometimes suggest uh, writing to, to health professionals with a letter, an old fashioned letter, because I don't know, I think uh, yeah, people feel you have to, a, a greater sense of need to respond to that. Um, I think there's often health professionals don't realize what patients are experiencing or that they feel the things that are, are upsetting them or they don't realize that they're not really confident about the diagnosis for example and that they really want to go back around and understand why is it you're making this diagnosis what what were my positive diagnostic features so that's partly why i made the formulator to try and to try and help people articulate these things about what they think's happened, whether they agree it's the right, is it the right time for treatment? What therapy do they want? So I'm, that's, that's where I hope that sort of approach might help. I, I think that would be helpful. Those communications can really be um, kind of broken down into where maybe a doctor is trying to help, but maybe you've been to five other doctors that didn't feel helpful. And so 
maybe there's some miscommunication, misunderstanding. So I think always asking for clarification and saying that made me feel this way. Is that how you intended it? Gives that opportunity to open those communications. And, and I think that tool, I, I think it's going to be really helpful. And you'd mentioned if people have feedback, is there a place on that tool to provide feedback or how would you like that to be well, said? Well, I'm always happy to get feedback just generally on the, on the website and, and the formulator through the feedback link on, on your symptoms that will, that will come to me and I can, and I collect all the feedback and try and act on it when I can. Great. And I think that we'll kind of, I think we can end it there. I know there's still a lot of questions. Like I said, I think uh, we touched on as many as I could get um, in for the hour, but we sure do appreciate all the work and support that you do for FND and for the FND community in general. And we just want to encourage people if, to go to the neurosymptoms.org website, download the app. Those tools are there to help. Also, the videos, uh, if you had questions, maybe dive into our YouTube, the FND Hope YouTube channel that we have available for you or fndhope.org. There's some great questions there on our Facebook pages. I also want to just throw out, we are going to be launching the new registry that we have up and going here shortly. And so we want to encourage patients to participate in that research and learn more about that. If they have questions, uh, please ask us. And we're hoping by the end of the year to have that up and going. So thank you again for your time. And thank you, everyone. Any final words? No, if no just saying, though, thanks to everyone that comes. Fantastic. So, so about 250 people here. I'm sure there are many and more probably watching online. So it's great to see such a, by, uh, a an active and vibrant FND community. So keep it going. It's great. Well, thank you. Thanks. Have a great day.